Our DM got invested in a backstory for a few NPCs, and one of them was flirting and swooning over a player's character. The player reciprocated NPCs' feelings for a short time, but over the months of the campaign, they drifted away, and the character ultimately ended that relationship. We thought everyone would just move over, but the DM keeps reintroducing that NPC and making it seem like the end of their romance is the end of the world. Creates a narrative in which we should reach out to that NPC and support them. The NPC is a young squire. It's not like they need our support. And it gets really awkward for all of us to interact or flirt with the other NPCs or each other's characters. This atmosphere is followed by passive-aggressive comments. For example, we moved on. But my character heard they're a bad knight for supporting that PC and not reaching out to the NPC. And general awkwardness ensues. But we still have stuff to do in the campaign. I understand getting really invested with an NPC as a DM. Sometimes you really like the idea of a character, but the direction the players are going means they aren't going to stick around long. That's fine. Sometimes it's just not meant to be. But also, if you're going to be running a character strictly as a romance option, you need to be a hell of a lot more open to the idea of rejection. Or you're going to creep out your players, causing your suave, sexy swashbuckler to start looking like an incel beta orbiter with a Twitter addiction who sends death threats to a YouTuber on the basis that he likes girls. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to The Crow's Perch. We're in between runs of delivering pipe bombs to the mailboxes of people who cause Joe Cat to leave YouTube. I also narrate stories from my favorite hobby tabletop role-playing games. But today's video would not have been possible without today's sponsor, Into the AM. Into the AM designs premium graphic tees, hoodies, and all kinds of apparel. The shirts are soft with tons of color variations with gorgeous designs. I really, really, really have to reiterate that their designers made some absolutely beautiful stuff that's great for everyday wear. My brother was a big fan of their stuff for the longest time, and I was honestly shocked that they reached out to me for a sponsored video. I personally ordered the Neon Geisha, Tranquil Ascent, and Neon Shores tees, and they look even better in person than they do on their website. So if you're looking to upgrade your wardrobe and get some really nice new clothes for a great price, I'd highly suggest checking out Into the AM and using my promo code CROWSPERCH. That's C-R-O-E-S P-E-R-C-H for a 10% off coupon code. Thank you once again Into the AM for sponsoring today's video. And now, let's gather up a murder and dive into today's stories. So obviously, in-game turn-based combat is the only way to do things. If we didn't, we'd be screaming over each other like wild animals. During a time-sensitive mission, the DM described a golem boarding a location that I wanted to enter. I split off from my party members, as my character often did, to breach the area. Don't worry. My party has a sending stone with my name on it. We knew the dungeon would begin to crumble when we took its treasure. So the party said they'd contact me when the process began. Insert a fight with a golem guarding a poison-filled stockpile I wanted to enter. The party messaged me before I was done and said the 10-minute timer had begun. Perfect. I have a scroll of dimension door, and this felt worth wasting it on. I was going to wait until the very last second. Well... The golem was described as getting weaker, and because its attacks rely on poison, to which I was immune, the fight wasn't going well for him. So, he decided, on his turn, he was gonna... do... nothing. I laughed and began describing my turn. Because doing nothing means he's turn skipping. The DM stopped me, and began laughing, as the golem described that as long as he doesn't move, they're both stuck there, as he doesn't plan on ending his turn. I asked what the canonical reason for me just sitting there and letting this happen is. The DM said, Combat is turn-based. You can escape outside of your turn, and said that this was the true trap of the golem. Then just moved on. I was confused about what was going on, as the DM described, before I could contest, the temple falling apart. I rolled death saves. A nat 1 and a 7. I was just dead, because apparently this is like Pokemon. According to the DM, my Wanty Poisoner is a polite little gentleman, taking his kindly patience and waiting for the golem he planned on killing, then robbing, to take his turn, being openly told that he doesn't plan on doing anything, and still just standing there and waiting. This reminds me of some of the old Final Fantasy games where you're on a train or something, and it's still moving even though you're still selecting your actions on your turn. 
Except in this case, if you take a little too long reheating the bean burrito you left on the couch, the train derails and crashes into a bomb factory. Next time, this dungeon master needs to go back through the books. And remember that you're supposed to think of each round like a block of six seconds worth of action. Yeah, it gets a little weird during the early levels, when your fighter needs six whole seconds to pull on the string of a short bow and shoot once, but hey, at least no one's getting stunlocked because their opponent decided to perform the tabletop equivalent of closing their game in the middle of a fight. I'm honestly shocked that I'm even here. I truly thought that I would never have a horror story of my own. I've been playing D&D since I was 14. I am now 36 and never had a bad experience. Until now. So my mother decided that she would run a D&D &D campaign with some of her friends, and I was invited to play too. Yay, I love playing D&D &D with my mom and was excited to meet her friends who were all brand new to the game. Well, why do you get to have the parents that play D&D? &D? I mean, I have one that plays video games, but come the flock on, that's bullshit. Ah! It should have been me! The people in this story are my mom, age 55, the DM, Clara, age 30 something, the rogue, Tilly, age 30 something, the fighter, myself, age 36, as the cleric, and our problem player, Betty, age 60-something, the wizard. A little background before we lead up to the big blow-up. I should have known that things were going to go downhill when I noticed Betty being a bit aggressive towards Clara. Betty would constantly make little jabbing remarks to Clara, out of character, but Clara always seemed chill about it, just shrugging off the pointed comments, smiling, and continuing with the game. The entire table noticed Betty's antagonistic attitude towards Clara, but since Clara seemed unfazed, we all let it slide. Which was a mistake. We really should have asked Clara if she was okay with Betty's behavior. Anyway, the game progresses and after a few sessions, Clara and Tilly gain a firmer grasp on their character sheets and overall skills. Betty did not. She continued to have a difficult time navigating her sheet and spells. She would cast level 2 spells, using level 1 slots, as well as trying to use spells outside of her class. Honestly though, a player not understanding the rules or getting confused doesn't bother me. I'm more of a role player, and Betty was good at role playing, so I had fun playing with her. But my mom noticed Betty struggling, and decided to purchase her a player's handbook. That way, she could read the rules at her own leisure. Mom also wrote out a bunch of spell cards for Betty. Unfortunately, it didn't really help much. At least I didn't notice a difference in Betty's gameplay. I doubt she even opened the book, but that's just my speculation. I'm sure it's clear to you now that Betty needed a little extra help during gameplay. It's the fateful day of the big blow-up. Betty was the first to arrive, and says she's not feeling well. She has a chronic illness. Mom asks her if she's sure she wants to play. Betty says she does. The playing will help her take her mind off it. Fair enough. I would have had the same mindset too. Then Betty starts talking negatively about Clara. I had a dream that Clara came strutting up in fancy clothes and told us that she had fun, but she's done playing with us peasants. Instead, she's going to take everything she learned and play D&D with her new, better friends. She said this with a twinge of ire in her voice, as if the events really happened, and she was angry at Clara for betraying the group. I laughed and said, that's a wild dream, gently trying to nudge her and to realize that getting upset over something that didn't actually happen is a bit much. A few moments later, Tilly and Clara show up together, and before Clara's left butt cheek can touch her seat, Betty purses her lips and tells her all about the dream. Clara laughed nervously, saying that she would never do that, and I again reiterated, Haha, what a funny dream, putting some emphasis on the word dream. As usual, we shrug off the odd interaction and begin playing. This is the last day of our campaign after all. We are going to fight the BBG. All of us even dressed up for the occasion. Betty sported a brand new pair of elf ears that unfortunately kept falling off. This was the start of the proverbial dominoes falling. First domino. The ears kept falling off Betty's head. This happened a few times and eventually my mom said, You don't have to wear them if they're bothering you. Betty took this as a slight, thinking that my mom was annoyed with her. 
But my mom just wanted to make sure that Betty was comfortable. Second domino. Betty rolls a natural 20 on an initiative roll, which basically means it's just a regular old 20. Nothing special happens, but it's still nice because you most likely get to go first. However, Betty didn't really know that. So later on, when someone else rolled a natural 20 on a hit die, my mom made a big deal out of it and brought out a special success die. Basically, you can roll it to see what cool thing your character did, if you couldn't think of something on your own. Betty saw this and thought it was unfair, and that my mom was ignoring her nat 20. I tried to explain that it was rolled on an initiative roll, but Betty didn't react. So she either didn't hear me, or didn't understand why I was bringing it up. I looked around and no one spoke up. So I figured Betty must have rolled a nat 20 on a different roll while I was stuffing my face with snacks. A few days later, she confirmed that the nat 20 was in fact rolled for initiative. So my mom apologized for not seeing the 20, and told Betty to make sure she announces her nat 20s because they are a big deal. Mom also said that Betty could roll the success die on her next attack, but Betty was thoroughly peeved by this point, and snapped back. Maybe you should be paying attention. My mom was shocked. I have a lot going on. I'm running combat. There was a bit of an awkward silence, and then we continued playing. The third and final domino. Betty wanted to cast a spell that wasn't a part of her class. I can't remember what spell it was, but it wasn't a wizard spell. At least not one of her school of knowledge. Mom paused the game to double check the handbook, and then passed it over to Betty. I don't see that spell on the list. Here, take a look. Do you see it there? Oh lordy. This sent Betty over the edge. She started to get red in the face, and blurted out, Yes, it's not there. Don't treat me like a child. I'm not stupid. My mom stands up while simultaneously raising her hands like she's surrendering. Mom, I'm not. I'm trying to help you, and you're starting to get worked up. Betty, I'm not worked up. You're taking things personally, and you're overreacting. Mom, okay, okay. Then let's relax and continue the game. As she started to sit back down, Betty muttered something under her breath. I couldn't hear what she said, but apparently my mom did. Because then she said, Oh, now why would you want to say that to me? Betty started to cry, and said that she doesn't know why she does this. Why she pushes everyone away. It really broke my heart to hear that. But before I could offer any words of comfort, she started hissing out profanities, and saying that she needs to leave right the flock now. My mom offered to give her a ride home. Betty had gotten a ride to mom's. She declined, so I chimed in, saying that maybe we should end the session, or at least take a break. Then I took a moment to reassure Betty that I wanted her to stay and play, but understood if she needed to leave. She decided to take a break, and we all sat there, in stunned silence, until it was shattered by Betty. Oh, I see. You don't want me here. She then hurriedly got up from the table, and started to speed walk away. I was startled and called after her. What? No, you can sit here. You can take your break anywhere you want, Betty. And Clara called out to Betty too, urging her to come back. Betty stopped, turned back, and started calling herself stupid. I audibly huffed and told her she's not stupid. Betty continued to cry, and then said she's going outside to wait for her husband to pick her up. My mom then offered to go outside with her, because it's cold and she didn't want Betty to be alone. Betty yelled back, I'm not a child, then ran outside and a moment later, we saw her running down the road while weeping. Her husband intercepted her shortly after. All of our hearts were pounding from the interaction. She flew off the handle, despite us really trying to de-escalate the situation. Poor Tilly was shaking for the whole ordeal. She wasn't able to speak for a bit. Eventually, we talked about our feelings and ultimately decided to finish the campaign. I'm glad we did, because the rest of us had a lot of fun, and it helped us return to normalcy. Later that night, I messaged Betty, saying, I'm sorry everything became so overwhelming. Hugs. Hope you feel better, and are able to decompress for the rest of the day. She wrote back a simple yet effective, I'm sorry, and you would think that this was the end of it all. But, of course it wasn't. So we have a D&D &D messenger group, and even though Betty said she wasn't coming back, we all decided not to kick her from the group right away, just in case she changed her mind. 
A week goes by, and she hasn't checked the group at all. But she has been making passive-aggressive Facebook statuses regarding the incident. She even suggested that she had to go to the hospital because of how much stress we put her through. Tilly is pretty upset by this, and decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Betty. Apparently, Tilly and Betty have been friends for a while, and Betty seemed to respect what Tilly had to say. She said she was truly sorry for what happened, and for the unfair Facebook posts that she wouldn't post them anymore. Though, I'm sure you, dear reader, or dear listener in this case, realize that Betty most definitely kept on posting. I ignored the posts, but my mom decided that she needed to reach out to Betty and talk things out. She called her, but got no answer, so she left a voicemail. Now, I haven't heard this voicemail, but I can summarize the tone just from knowing my mother. It was most likely apologetic for the miscommunication, but with a firm air and she most likely brought up issues that bothered her too. Betty receives this voicemail and goes nuclear, calling my mom up and swearing, telling her how rude the voicemail was and how my mom ruined her anniversary. None of us knew that her anniversary was that day. Betty quickly got onto Facebook and moaned about how my mom called her screaming and intentionally ruined her anniversary. Like I said, I didn't personally hear the voicemail or phone call, but I am 100% sure that my mother did not scream at Betty. Well, Mom talked to us all, and we agreed that it was time to officially kick Betty from the group. She hadn't even checked the group since the big blow-up. Plus, there really wasn't any coming back after how she treated Mom. We all still remained Facebook friends, though, and watched as Betty obsessed over being kicked. I figured she was just venting, and would eventually move on. Two weeks later, and she's still talking about it. But this time, she was blatantly lying. She posted saying that we yelled at her, and that we were all furious with her for being sick and crying. That we kicked her from the group because we couldn't handle chronically ill people who are struggling. Basically telling all her Facebook friends that we are a group of malevolent assholes who hate people with chronic illnesses. Betty, girl. Please, please stop posting. You don't have to do this to yourself. I know that Facebook is like crack to the brain of anyone over 50. But girl, have some self-respect. You're better than this. Or at least, I really hope that you are. But considering that we're not quite at the end of this story, I'm probably wrong about this one. I couldn't ignore this post. I decided to reply telling her that none of us yelled at her. That in fact, we had tried really hard to de-escalate the situation and wanted her to stay, but that she insisted on leaving, and we certainly weren't going to force her to stay. I also let her know that I was not and am not furious with her, but that this drama is making me very uncomfortable, and that I don't think we can be friends anymore. I still feel a bit sad for Betty though. After all, she might be purposefully pushing people away due to some sort of trauma that she's dealing with. I hate that she's struggling, but it's ultimately up to her to seek help. Anyway, I went on to set the record straight with my reply, which was promptly deleted. Not even sure if she read the entire thing. That's how fast it was deleted. I posted again, and poof, deleted once more. So, I messaged her. Me, Betty. It's really unfair to blast us in public, and then not even let us speak our piece. Betty. It's not public. Only my friends. Life isn't fair. I asked her why she was being mean, and then she promptly unfriended me. But I was told that she made a Facebook post saying, I'm not mean. I'm a hippie. Whatever that means. Heck, she even blocked Tilly, because Tilly had replied to the post saying that she felt hurt by it. Like, how dare Tilly feel upset about her friend saying terrible lies about her, right? Poor Tilly's really upset about losing her friend like this. But honestly, it seemed inevitable. Betty said it herself. I don't know why I do this. I don't know why I keep pushing everyone away. So, most likely, she would have kicked Tilly out of her life at some point anyway. Still sucks, though. So yeah, good riddance, Betty. I hope you figure your shit out. I truly do wish you the best. But please, never bring your shit near me my mom, or my friends ever again. That's the end, I hope. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. 
and thanks for reading about my first bad experience playing a TTRPG. P.S. Thanks for introducing me to this subreddit, Crit Crab Crispy Crow Cro <laughs> Reference. Finally, recognized for all of my hard work. I feel like I gotta frame this somewhere, somewhere nice, like a porta potty in a defunct community center in the Philadelphia Badlands, maybe with a big gold star on it. I got a little sidetracked, which is probably why this doesn't happen that often. Drake and Sir Knox. I love listening to y'all's vids while I'm working. TLDR, a player in our D&D group freaks out at the DM for a myriad of small offenses, then calls herself stupid, runs down the street crying, and then lies about the rest of the party on her Facebook page. Oh, Betty, you old bat. You really messed this one up, didn't you? I feel really bad for this group. Like I said before, being able to play with one of your parents a tabletop game must be pretty fucking great, and it's a real shame that this whole affair got muddied by Betty. There was something in particular that Betty said that really struck a nerve with me, though. That they kicked her from the group because they couldn't handle chronically ill people who were struggling. The fact that she would make this kind of accusation to the group was really upsetting to read, especially from my own perspective, as I've played plenty of games with people who suffer from mental illnesses that can even sometimes impede the amount of time that we're able to play. I don't mention this to diminish her struggle, but to say that just because she's struggling doesn't mean that she gets the right to freely act in a way that hurts others, especially friends, just because she's hurting. It's callous, and judging by how she said she knows she pushes people away, she knows her actions and words are inexcusable. But the sad reality remains that she actively pushed the group out anyway. Having these delusions is one thing, but acting on them, especially as aggressively as Betty has done, is an entirely different thing. And so, ultimately, to the OP, user Zulala on Reddit, you don't need this in your life, and I wish you the best in your future games. This story is a nice reminder that the people you meet playing online can always be a mixed bag. I'd recently gone through a slew of interviews for a game I'm running, when I interviewed one candidate who, from the beginning, felt a bit off. At first, the guy was just a bit awkward, which isn't necessarily bad when you're first meeting someone, but as the conversation continued, the red flag started showing as he admitted he'd been kicked from several games before, with no apparent explanation slash warning, and could only play via paid games, and also that he was particularly interested in playing a homebrew juvenile dragon character. Another red flag. But the thing that really got me was the constant actual sounding moaning from him as we talked. Like, I'm not exaggerating when I say it genuinely sounded like he was edging with a vibrator. It went something like this. Me. So, how experienced would you say you are with 5e? Him. I've been playing for a couple years now. <laughs> with a few different groups between that time. Why are you the way that you are? I don't know if it was a speech impediment or if he was actually playing with himself, but it made me uncomfortable as hell. And past experiences playing online have taught me to trust my gut about first impressions. I didn't want to be rude or make him feel bad, though. So I finished up the interview and moved on to the others. When I informed the dude after a few days that I didn't think we'd be a good fit, they got really upset and asked what he'd done wrong. I told them that I just felt we weren't exactly compatible, personality-wise and also that the constant moaning sounds from him were really off-putting and made it sound like they were masturbating. I didn't want to shame him if it was actually a speech impediment, but I felt a bit sorry for him and figured maybe he didn't realize he was doing it and that it was the reason they'd been kicked before. That and he did ask me why, after all. Cue a tantrum claiming that I was being too picky, that I must be a horror story DM. Remember, this person literally admitted They'd been kicked from several games before. Blah, blah, blah. So I just blocked him before he could continue with the immature sour grapes. Given how he responded, I'm thinking that he was in fact cranking it. Considering the fact that he threw a fit instead of just shutting down the idea that he was potentially slapping the ham sandwich is a little odd. But I guess so is the idea of wanting to play as a juvenile dragon for your first game with a new DM. And if that character turned out to have a dark and mysterious past, it would bring a whole new meaning to the term... 
Edgelord. Though personally, I would prefer the term Edge being associated with a character who's sharpening their dagger with a scowl. Instead of someone who's making direct and unflinching eye contact with the rest of the party, as he begins to furiously polish his, um, magic oh. wand. With a little else to add to this one, aside from making jokes about edging, I think this is where we're gonna have to end today's stories. And if you like today's stories and would like to see more of them, then feel free to like this video and subscribe to the channel. But if you'd like to support the channel even further, then feel free to sign up on the Crow's Perch Patreon, or submit your own story by email or on the Crow's Perch Discord. Links for all this in the description of this video. Patrons also get access to video on demand of live streams, and are the first to get access and announcements to upcoming videos. Their names are also on screen right now, and all of them are very cool people. Not just because they're paying me to say this, but yes, also because they're paying me to say this. Like our counts of quills. Jess Monica, Critical Kunik, Evix, King Drazil, Christian Pip, Cosmosis, Rikus, Haley Thompson, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. Oh, Betty, you old bat. Ain't that just like you to forget our barons of beaks? Like Archangel Nuriko, Easiest CC, Keone, Jonathan Fenton, Miss Tiger Beans, New Haven RP, Kieran Slater, Running Bear, Haley McAuliffe, Brittany Mars, oh, Spectre Spark, Oz to Rock, Ghost Legan, The School Bus, Kuntos Weasel, Lord Rend, Wormy, Dana the Drake, McEatley, and who could forget, Anya. I was thinking of something clever. Something clever that I could call the Dukes of Feathers. For giving me ten dollars a month instead of five. Like, like Xeno Cruz. Repetitive Debug? Apocalypso? Fable and Flourish? Angrad? Grunt? Kive Mind? Quinn? Jarrett Soar? And Matthew McQueenie? And with all of that, out of the way. I will see you next time, as the crow flies. <laughs>